Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com where you can send in your own personal paranormal stories, watch horror hosts present old, scary movies 24-7, see weird news items, listen to the Weird Darkness syndicated radio show, shop for Weird Darkness and Weirdo merchandise, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, sign up for the newsletter to win free stuff I give away every month, and more. And on the social contact page, you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, and you can also join the Weird Darkness Weirdos Facebook group. Coming up in this episode, I thought I'd bring back a classic from the podcast. I often get comments on YouTube, on Facebook, or receive an email saying that somebody liked a certain episode for this reason or that. Usually it's a comment about how creepy or scary a specific story was, or it's someone sharing an incident that happened to them that was similar or, more often than not, just a note of encouragement to thank me for the podcast, which I do love getting, by the way. But very few episodes have garnered the amount of positive feedback that I Drive for Cerber has. So for those of you who have not heard it before, or for those of you who loved it the first time and wouldn't mind another go-around, I proudly present I Drive for Cerber by Mofucius. Now, bolt your doors lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. My name is Jim. I've been in and out of construction contracts for the last 17 years. Between those contracts, I do what I can to make a few extra bucks. Since you never really know when the next contract will show up and unemployment pays you just enough to lay awake hungry at night. Most of us have heard of Uber and Lyft. I figured it was the perfect way to sustain my takeout burrito habits until my next work order. However, my driving record isn't exactly clean. I owe a few thousand dollars in fines for my DUI from three years ago. Before anyone goes up in arms, no one was injured and I wasn't in an accident. I was leaving the liquor store for the third time that afternoon and was busted by a cop, waiting in the parking lot for me to wobble back into my car. It's pretty foolish, considering the liquor store is in walking distance but my drunk brain was more concerned with being mugged than being caught by police. Lesson learned. I'm sober now. Fatter from an oral fixation on Mexican food, but sober. When I failed to meet the requirements for Uber, I went searching online for something similar to ride-sharing or some sort of P2P smartphone-type workout. Well, I came across an app called Cerber. I was reading one of those 10 Ways to Make Money Without Bleeding Out articles, and I saw an advertisement for Cerber on the side of the article. Big, orange letters glowed against a black background with the phrase, Hellish Commutes Made Heavenly. I found that to be pretty cheesy marketing, but since I've never heard of this specific company before, I figured they were a startup and wouldn't be all that picky about participants. I went ahead and filled out a brief application, submitted, and hoped for the best. This is where it started to get weird. Immediately, I say immediately, after I hit submit, my phone rang. It was 11.47 p.m., 
when I pissed myself to the phone ringing. I looked at my phone to see unknown illuminating the screen in my dimly lit bedroom. I don't answer those calls during regular business hours, let alone during the late night. I decided to respect their privacy, ignore the call, and not bother to find out who was calling me. I shoved another taquito in my face and made my way towards my unmade bed. As soon as I dove into my flattened, stale pillows to begin my pity party, the phone rang again. It still said unknown, but it was now coming in as an emergency. Hmm, why? Well, I answered the phone to a woman's voice veiled with a cheerful disposition that had to be fueled by caffeine and cocaine. Hello, is this James Atwell? She chirped. Uh, yeah, who's this? Hi, this is Adeline with Cerber calling you back about the application you just submitted. Oh, uh, I was still tonguing chicken taquito out of my teeth. Hi, that was awful fast. Did I submit incorrectly? I said with clear apprehension but moderate enthusiasm. These folks were fast. No, not at all. I could hear her clicking her mouse as she spoke to me. I just wanted to alert you that we've reviewed your application and would like to know when you could start. Uh, I struggled to get some pants on, cradling the phone between my ear and shoulder. I finished buttoning my pants and say, now I guess, are people active this late? Oh yes, our most active hours are between 10 p.m. and 4.30 a.m. She stops clicking her mouse. Please, download the application onto your phone, quickly make a profile, and you'll be ready to receive requests. Do you have any questions? I can hear her smiling. Gross. Uh, no, I, I don't think so, I say as I finish zipping up my jacket. Wonderful. Thank you for choosing Cerber. Give him hell, Jimmy boy. She hung up before I could respond. Give them hell? What the actual... Okay, well, no time to waste, I suppose. I download the app, make my profile, and mark myself as available. I drive a relatively new SUV, so I'm not exactly convinced I'll be the first pick. Gas isn't cheap, and everybody wants to save money. This means I have some time to clean out the taco foils and cardboard boats out of my car. About 20 minutes into trying to alleviate my car of the turgid smell of jalapeno and old cheese, I got my first ring. It was a ride request for one person, a man named Ray, seeking a ride to San Francisco. The city's about an hour from where he's requesting the ride, but a drive I am very familiar with. I tap on accept throw the bag of trash in the garbage bin and start heading over to the pinned location. To my surprise, I was directed to a neighborhood that was just a few blocks away from me. I parked outside of a post-80s style suburban home, coated in sharp sparkle and salmon pink paint. From the door, I see Ray emerge from his pastel green door and immediately I knew something was off. Ray was obscenely tall. He had to be an easy seven and a half feet, slouching. He shoved his pallid hands into the pockets of his gray jacket, hood pulled well over his head so that his face wouldn't be seen. His long, thin legs, adorning blue jeans and clean black dress shoes, carried his slender frame at a calm stride to my vehicle. As he came closer, I noticed he was wearing a tie and a formal jacket under his normal hoodie different strokes, I guess. He approached my window, his head down, and said, Jim? Yeah, you're right. He sounds so normal. This man is anything but. Yeah, would it be too much trouble to ask you to fold the first row of seats for me? Because, you know. He gestures below his torso to his knees, all while still keeping his head down. He didn't want me to see his face but I didn't feel threatened by him, so I just ignored his lack of eye contact. Uh, yeah, sure, no problem at all. He steps back so that I can open my door and access the back seat. I folded the first row of seats so that the third row was the only place left to sit. Ray climbs in, takes his seat, and buckles up. Thanks, man. Of course. Bought this thing for comfort anyway, know what I mean? I chuckled. He remained silent with his head facing out the window awkward. 
The silence of the drive was excruciating. I did my best not to spend too much time glancing back at him. He hardly moved. Every few minutes he would uncross and recross his legs. My nervous tendencies finally got the best of me and I had to be that guy. Those are some serious stems, I nervously chuckled. You play basketball as a kid? Maintaining his gaze out the window, he replies, That's a serious gut. You eat a lot of food? I got immediately defensive, but I brought this on myself and kept my mouth shut. Doesn't feel good, does it? Someone commenting on your size, he said so calmly. Uh, no, it doesn't. I apologize. I said it through gritted teeth. I was no longer inspired to conjure up any more small talk for the duration of this ride. About 30 minutes later, we arrive at his destination, which led me to Old Fort Miley. I never recalled this place having an actual address. While my gaze was fixed on the location, dumbfounding me as to why anyone would want to be here this late, he slowly got out of the car and closed the door. He kept his back to me and pulled out his phone as he started walking away. I was still very much in a state of what the hell when I got a notification on my phone. He gave me five bat wings and a 20% tip, bringing the grand total to $1,279.37. My jaw about hit my lap at that astronomical amount. As I brought my face up to try and stop him and alert him of what had to be a mistake, he kept walking, put his hand up, and gave a gentle wave. I watched him until he was far into the trees before I finally looked back down at my phone. He left a written review for other riders that read, Go easy on him, he's new. What the actual hell? I sped home as fast as I could without tipping off any highway patrols. I ran inside my house, darted to my computer, and tried to make sense of what I just got myself into. To my chagrin, I couldn't find a single thing on the internet about Cerber. Not even a website, beyond the application page, that is, that they offered through the advertisement. I sat back in my chair for a moment, my hands in my lap, and continued to process everything. Who pays that kind of money for an hour ride? Who the hell was in my car? What the hell was in my car? I grabbed my phone and opened the app again. Maybe something was there that could provide some kind of answers. Well, I found my answer. I clicked on the menu option that you'd see for most applications and found a description option. It read as follows. Cerber is a dedicated ride-sharing company that ensures anonymity and safe transportation of the paranormal. It goes on to talk about rates, amenities, and safety measures. I never had a chance to read the terms and agreements. No one does. I went back to check everything I signed, and sure enough, it's a transport service for ghosts and stuff. The rates applicable to me are just too good to pass up. Two-thirds of what it cost to pay my mortgage was made in a matter of an hour. Maybe this is dangerous. Maybe. Maybe it's absolutely insane, but I'm going to stick this out and see where it takes me. I was not ready. Tonight has been insane. I got waterproof seat covers, let's face it, water is not the concern here, and salt-free snacks. I had a hard time finding a way to get finger foods, so I just got unsalted nuts and dried fruit. I had no clue what paranormal entities ate, so I just took a stab at it. I learned quickly that paranormal entities couldn't care less about almonds and dehydrated nectarines. Can't really blame them, actually. I tried my best to get a good night's rest after the strange evening I had. Part of me was too shaken to sleep. The other part was partial excitement on what my next ride would be like. I eventually gave up on sleep and went to a general store to pick up snacks, water bottles, and seat covers. After coating my car in as much vinyl preventive measure as humanly possible, I treated myself to enchiladas and a cold Pepsi. After my meal, I felt accomplished enough to attempt sleep again. I was awakened by another unknown call, 11.47 p.m. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out who was calling me at this time. I eagerly picked up the call, nearly dropping the phone. 
I have questions. Adeline burst into a giggling hysteria and replied, Oh, I'm sure you do, Jim. What would you like to know? First off, I held a finger in the air, ignoring that this was a phone call, not a physical confrontation. Why the hell are you calling me so late? Last time we spoke, it was this exact time. You answered then, and I figured if I called you at the same time, you would answer at that exact time. She said it calmly and slowly. Hmm, good point. I carry on with false confidence, trying to pretend that I don't feel as stupid as I sound. Second, I want to know if the payment I received was a mistake, I asked, chewing on my thumbnail. No, not at all. Was that not proper compensation? It appears that Ray gave you a pretty generous tip. Would you like to file a dispute? I could hear her clicking her mouse again. No, I yelled into the phone, mostly because I wouldn't want to see what's in store for anybody that pisses Ray off. I cleared my throat and continued. No, sorry, I I just feel like that was maybe too generous. Why was the fee so high for Ray? I'm kind of afraid of what the answer might be. Jim, I can assure you that the compensation was not an accident. Do you remember the part of the application that asked you if you had a spouse, relative, children's, or friends? My heart found its way to my colon. I knew where this was going. Yeah, I remember. I practically croaked my answer. My throat felt so dry. Well, to put it as gently as I can, she stops clicking her mouse, the riders that you're transporting are not typical beings like yourself. Most of them are harmless, but some, insert long, unnecessary pregnant pause, it can be dangerous. If something were to happen to you, we would prefer not to worry about liability lawsuits. It's not that your life bears little meaning, it's just business, Jim. I sit back and recall my answer. I have no one. I answered no to that part of the application. I let the answer sink in too long and I hear Adeline chime in. Are you still with us, Jim? Do you have more questions? Uh, I close my eyes and try to gather my thoughts. Yeah, what sort of amenities and safety measures should I be worried about? I ask, rubbing my very stressed out temple. We'll start with the uncomfortable topic of safety measures, get the ugly out of the way. She begins with a soft yet sinister tone. You should get yourself an airtight container to hold sage and a lighter inside. Sometimes certain entities can leave behind an unseen residue, and the moment you feel a heaviness after your passenger has exited, you'll want to burn some of it in your vehicle until you can feel the tension as dispersed. I scurry to find a pad and pen to write this down. She continues, You'll also want to invest in a raincoat or a poncho. A raincoat? Adeline? I ask in exasperation. Yes, Jim, a raincoat. I roll my eyes and continue to make my list. Make sure you also invest in a face mask, protective eyewear, and booties. You can never be too careful, she finishes. All right. I complete the rest of the recommended items list. Now, what about the amenities? Well, that depends on how willing you are to get your hands dirty for your riders. I could hear the smirk. Just how important is it to you to ensure your riders receive the highest quality experience? Uh, not very, I say defensively. I'm sure the government has already tapped into my line by now. I just want to drive and maybe not die. Extra steps sound like it could tamper with that. She lets out a chortle. Is there anything else I can do for you, Jim? Uh, no. I feel no more confident now than I did before picking up the call. Thanks, Adeline. No problem, Jimmy boy. Her sickening disposition returns as if this is all just so normal for her work nights. Can we count on you to continue driving for us? I stare off into the bedroom wall, chewing on that question. Well, why shouldn't I? The money's right. The work is interesting, and I make my own hours. I would be an absolute fool to turn this down, now that I think about it. The worst that happens is I die, and after discussing the pitiful state of my private life and the lack of people therein, it doesn't really seem all that bad. Yes, I say, switching the phone from one ear to the next. Yeah, I'll keep driving for Cerber. Wonderful, 
she exclaims. Good luck. I'll be in touch. Thanks. Have a good night, Adeline. Uh, uh, the line went dead before I could finish. It was already after midnight. It's time to get my ass into gear. I don't have time to pick up the safety items. I survived without them last time, and, and I feel I'll get more ride requests on a Friday night. Safety gear is going to have to wait. I park at a local donut shop that remains open 24 hours. It's not tacos, but I can get a churro there, close enough. My phone dings with a request from someone named Borg in a residential area just four minutes away. The final destination was a 12-minute ride to an old industrial building that I thought was shut down. I accept the request, dust the cinnamon sugar off my shirt, and start driving. I'm instantly relieved when I see that the request did not come from Ray. He was nice enough, but his potential is absolutely terrifying. I pull up to a very plain and vapid home. It was well kept, with a brand new fence. It was just ordinary. So far, so good. Then Borg walked out. Again, with the tall. He was a mammoth of a man, standing at least seven feet tall, jaw slack with a large set of tusks weighing down such massive jowls, dripping with saliva. Borg was dragging a very large hammer, wearing mild construction gear, including a hard hat, tool belt, and cement-crusted boots. My eyes were wide, drawing in as much of this creature as my retinas could handle. Jim? He bellowed as if trying to call my attention from across four football fields. My body still vibrating, I reply with, Borg? I don't know what compelled me to be so risky as to yell at him, but my body was going rogue at this point. Yes, Borg! Borg opens my door with shocking delicacy, climbs into the back seat, accidentally slamming his hammer on his own foot. He didn't flinch, but I totally caught that. Borg stares at the back of my headrest, breathing like a hog with bronchitis. He had breath bad enough to gag a maggot. Just getting off work? I ask, to try and stave off the wet snorting sounds from behind me. Yes! Borg build fence! Borg need beer! Oh, buddy, I can relate. Yeah, Borg, do you have a volume dial? Tone it down and break the knob off, for the love of God. I finally snapped at him. See, that that's how I die. To my surprise, though, Borg lets out a thunderous cackle so loud I'm sure it gave me prostate cancer. Jim funny! Borg like Jim! I give him a weak smile and decide to just focus my attention on the road. We were rounding the last turn of the trip. I pull up to the abandoned warehouse, and it's just as dilapidated as I remember. The metal walls and roof were coated in rust, the wooden beams poking out of place with dry rot and patches of unkempt weeds swallowed up any semblance of a driveway. I come to a complete stop, and Borg plunks his massive boots onto the gravel. He gracefully closes my door and walks over to my window. Thanks, Jim! Go sleep! Jim look bad! What, are you kidding me? Good night, Borg! Go sleep! Borg too loud! I bark at him with a grin. He grins back and begins his short, seemingly painful walk to the front doors of the building. I caught myself half smiling as the doors shut to this murky mansion when it was violently interrupted by the realization that the smell Borg emitted had not followed him out of my car. Ah, oh, no, this is so bad. I quickly drive to a nearby gas station to assess the damage. This giant, sticky man-fetus was making all that noise for a reason. He literally crapped his own pants in my back seat, and his internal matter leaked everywhere, leaving big Borg butt-cheek imprints. <sighs> my night was clearly shot. I bought some paper towels, bleach, air fresheners, and a few taquitos from the gas station I was stopped at. It took me a full two hours to clean this hazardous waste out of my car, but I was still able to alleviate the blasphemous evidence from my back seat. It was around 3.52 a.m. when I finished. I remembered Adeline saying that the highest hours of operation ended around 4.30 a.m., so I went ahead and put out a ready signal to try and salvage my night. How I wish I would have gotten Ray instead. Anything else would have been better than this traumatizing experience. 
I got another ping almost instantly after putting out the signal. At least I had another fat payout to look forward to. Then I noticed something strange. The request was coming from the very gas station I was already parked at, from someone named Angela. Stranger still, there was no destination that followed. Albeit bizarre, I figured it was an app malfunction, and I accepted the request anyway. Immediately after accepting, my back door opened and shut so quickly it almost sounded like one fluid motion. Hi, James. That voice. There's no way. My blood instantly turns to ice and my body starts shaking violently. This isn't happening. This can't be real. I turn my head, slowly, shuddering at the woman who sat in the back seat. My horrified gaze met her with milky eyes, shattering my senses like glass. All of the terror, sadness, and despair I have ever encountered in my life, it's incomparable to what I was feeling in this very moment. Tears involuntarily streamed down my face, my mouth hanging open, hands tensed into fists on my steering wheel, white-knuckling my grip as if I may be ripped right through the roof of my car. This isn't real. It just can't be real. The request... It came from my dead sister, Angela. Our story, I Drive for Cerber by Mofucius, continues when Weird Darkness returns. Remember staying up late on a Friday or Saturday night, either at home or at a friend's house, and watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-movie with aliens, monsters, ghosts, alien monster ghosts, vampires, werewolves, and all other kinds of crazy, creepy characters? Those were fun nights, weren't they? Well, that's what the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com has to offer – all day, every day. Thanks to our friends at the Monster Channel, you can visit WeirdDarkness.com slash watch party right after listening to this episode and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie – or should I say, horror movie. And not only can you watch the B-movies and horror hosts streaming there 24-7, but once a month we all gather together to watch a movie and talk about it in the chat room on that same page. Get your frights and funnies on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. Angela. Angela, my sister, she died at the age of 24. I was 28. My sister was a tiny, intelligent, nerdy, and independent woman who prided herself on her ability to quote every scripture in the Bible in a non-denominational way, while also being able to recite every Greek god, their spouse, children, and histories therein. She had a natural curiosity for stories, sincere compassion for the voiceless, and loved her family deeply. Angela never missed a single Christmas dinner. She was working on her doctorate in international mythology before she died, and you all thought a philosophy degree was useless. Angela and I were very close. The four of us as a unit had very healthy relationships and could always rely on each other. We kept our circles small and tight. Her body was found dumped on the side of Highway 5, and it was in terrible condition. For those of you with weak bellies, I urge you to skip over this paragraph. Her body was severely sexually assaulted with instruments that involved slicing holiday ham. Her head was almost entirely severed from her shoulders. Appendages were found in a black garbage bag placed right next to her corpse. Stranger still, her cause of death was not due to any of these fatal blows. She was hot-shotted with heroin and was dead before this massacre could have taken place. The reason they know this is because when a body dies, blood coagulates and takes on a viscous texture, causing blood to pass through veins and arteries at a much slower rate. Paracoagulation with a stopped heart, no longer able to circulate and pump blood, you get a very minimal mess and little blood spatter. 
perhaps the most ominous and puzzling part, she was found wearing a necklace that no one in my family recognized. A small, silver bullet dangled from a delicate silver chain. It was like an anti-trophy, a clean breakaway from the typical psychopath. This person was a sadistic showman that meant to confuse and bring an unreasonably high shock value to anyone who stumbled upon the knowledge of his crime. And it worked. The case grew cold and hasn't been reopened since. None of us ever got closure from her death. Just two years after we buried her, our parents committed suicide. They locked themselves in the garage, doused themselves in gasoline, and lit themselves on fire. They were found still holding hands with no sign of struggle. The death of my parents didn't affect me as bad as Angela's death did, though. You expect your parents to expire someday. You don't expect your baby sister to be slaughtered. No one is ever ready for a call like that. My baby sister, the one who intentionally got a job at the bookstore to sneak books out simply to learn, was gone. Any hope and good that was left in me was buried along with her. I traded in the notions of starting my own family for the more tangible future of alcoholism. My baggage was exhausting enough for me, there's no reason to subject that sort of madness any further to someone else. The gnawing pain eventually went numb and formed invisible mental scar tissue to cover up any residual damage from that impact. Yep, there she was, staring at me with a vacant expression from the back seat of my car. I jumped into the back seat and hugged her tight, sobbing for several minutes while she tried to hush me as though we were being watched. James, please, she said, trying to quell the inconsolable teenager I was in that moment. I need your help. I immediately shot back, grabbing her arms. I thought I'd never see you again, Angela. It's been ten years, I said, gathering my composure. I know. She looked down in her lap, trying to hide her own pain. I'm sorry. I would have come sooner. I cut her off, resting my hands in my own lap and say, wait, why now? She looked back up at me and said, I would have come sooner, but you were self-destructing. Seeing ghosts would only amplify that sort of behavior, so I watched from afar. Okay, I nodded, looking past the milky desaturation of her eyes and into her now very present soul. I can understand that, but you're here now. What exactly do you need my help with? Her face became very stern, replying with, I messed up. You know how I was studying black masses, occultism and ritualistic spiritualism? I nodded and she continued. Well, I was turning up empty-handed in every path I traveled, so I dug deeper. She became uncomfortable and shifted in her seat. I decided to go through the dark web to find what I could on summoning entities. I eventually came into contact with a man who only referred to himself as Wade. She turned her face to the back of my seat and shut her eyes as if she had to scrape to the bottom of her cerebellum to recall the next few steps. He claimed that he could summon Baphomet and that he would perform such summons for me. However, I already knew that Baphomet could not be summoned, so he was going to make a huge fool of himself or I was going to witness one of the most intelligent entities ever written about. Both results would have been fruitful for my research. I was so concerned with just wanting more experience. I never stopped to evaluate the risks." She let herself chew on that for a minute. She looked like she was truly checking out of the conversation, so I softly spoke. Angela? She shook her head, bringing herself back to the discussion. I'm fine. She pushed her hair back, and that's when I saw the giant dark bruise with a tiny hole in the center of it, like an eerie halo. I chose to ignore it for now because I was growing impatient and wanted her to wrap up the story. We met at a coffee shop close to where I lived, and he drove us two hours out of the way to what looked like a barely standing building, lights still flickering inside. We walked in, and he instructed me to take my shoes and coat off. When I was done taking my second shoe off, I, I blacked out. I'm not sure how long I was out for or what delivered me to being unconscious, but 
I woke up clearly drugged. It was heroin, I interrupted. The cops told us you were hot-shotted. That's how you died. They told us you were not an addict since you didn't have any other physical distress from active use. Yeah. She rubbed her neck, staring forward. Well, he didn't kill me right away. He put an IV directly into my neck and delivered it slowly enough to keep me tranquilized first. A clear expression of rage swept over her face, but her voice remained calm. I woke up in what looked like a mortuary. I was on an old metal gurney, restrained by leather straps. That wasn't even necessary. I couldn't even lift my head, let alone escape. I knew I was going to die. I was just afraid it wasn't going to be quick. He told me that I was stupid for seeking dark answers to dark questions and that my demise was entirely my fault. He wasn't wrong. I put myself in that exact position. I felt foolish. I should have known that summoning Baphomet wasn't possible and that should have been enough to raise some red flags. I rolled my eyes at that last part. Nerd alert. He told me that my death was important regardless of how I had arrived to this situation, she continued, her voice taking on a monotonous infliction. He said that he wasn't even part of any known religious sector, that he was a one-man worship, and that it was because he was a true god among men. Her mouth curled up into a slight smirk, and she said, I verbally retaliated, though. My last words before he mainlined China right into my jugular were, I thought gods were perfect. You have mustard on your shirt and you reek of dollar store aftershave. You're not a god. You just suffer from narcissistic personality disorder. She crackled at her own remark. I wanted to cry just watching her reflect any sort of positive feeling. I've missed her so much. Well, that pissed him off enough to end it, she said, half smiling. I hope it brings you some sort of peace knowing that I didn't suffer. I nodded and replied, It does, but what exactly do you need my help with? Well, I want you to find him, I guess, she shrugged. I'm not his first or only victim. I'm not exactly sure what I want you to do once you find him, but I, I want him to stop this psychotic church of self agenda. You have any sort of lead you can give me? I asked eagerly. Maybe she wasn't sure what to do after he was found, but I had a few ideas. I may even call Ray for help. It's been ten years, she said, looking directly into my eyes, but I do remember where the location is, the funeral home that I died in. My hands start shaking, my breath trembling. Where was this exactly? It was then I heard my Cerber notification chime. She finally added the destination to the ride she had requested. I looked from my phone resting on the dash to her. She was smiling such a warm, lovely smile for being so dead. What do you say, James? She lifted her finger, pointing at my phone. Shall we begin? My body fled with pinpricks of pure adrenaline. Hell yeah! I jumped to my front seat. I've been waiting ten years for this. We started driving down I-5 South. We had a three-hour journey ahead of us. The tip better be fat. Angela and I spent the ride in relative silence for the first hour. Something wasn't sitting right with me. When telling me she wanted me to find him, my mind was too focused on the possibilities of torturing this crackhead that killed my sister. I almost missed that last part. Angela. My inquisition sliced through the quiet hum of my tires and penetrated her gaze on the road. Yeah? She was holding herself as if she was cold. There's something that's bugging me, I say, tapping my thumb on the steering wheel. What's up? No sign of a guilty conscience, and I'm not sure I felt so comforted by that notion. When you said, find him, I guess, what exactly does that mean? What do you mean by, you guess? I was just trying to hide the accusatory tone, but I've always been terrible with composing myself. Well, I don't really know. I feel like finding him and the resolve therein may allow me to leave this purgatory of just walking around the living. You know, unfinished ghost business. She genuinely sounded theoretical. You mean you don't know? Still sounding like I'm interrogating her. I can't help it. I've seen some weird stuff 
and since she's my sister, I feel like I can ask away. No bars hold. Strange, isn't it? She says, cocking her head to the side, allowing her eyes to do what I assumed was a blank stare. Her peepers didn't creep me out until then. You would think that dying delivers a sense of clarity or answers some questions. That's just not the case. Dying is like exiting scene one and walking into a different set, in a different costume and unrehearsed lines. It's confusing. I've read a lot about souls being trapped because of unfinished business, and I can't help but think I'll be closer to resting if I try every avenue, no matter how cliché it sounds. My heart crawled into my throat, choking me with sadness. I just got her back and she's already trying to leave. I try to soften the mood and say, well, why do you even want to go to heaven? There's no affirmation in the Bible that says there'll be tacos on the other side. Why chance it? I don't even know if heaven's real. I know this isn't necessarily my eternity, but heaven could just be a fairy tale for all I know. Damn, that backfired. Now I feel worse. So you're saying that what, your soul just dissipates? Still swallowing as much sorrow as I could. That's not what I'm saying. She almost sounded annoyed. I'm not sure if my stupid questions are irritating her or if she's irritated with her own lack of answers. I'm saying I don't know. I'm saying that I do know that I'm stuck and don't know what the next step is or what arrives thereafter. She stares out the window, concluding this discussion. I may suck at reading women, but I could tell I wore out the topic. I left well enough alone, grabbed another cold gas station taquito, and munched in silence. Sort of. So crunchy, even cold. My phone dinged with another Cerber notification. I squinted at the request to share a ride with the current passenger. I guess even the supernatural care about the environment, too. Makes sense. They're typically immortal or live longer than humans anyway. Being mindful of cutting back where you can is never a bad idea. They may also be just as cheap as my sister. Who knows? Hey, Angela, someone wants to share your ride for about 15 minutes. Is that cool? She nodded, still brooding in her own nerdy and dramatic state of despair. I hit accept to someone named Sayabon. I pulled up to a lake that was pinned in the request. Standing there was a gorgeous woman, long red hair, waxen skin, and a black dress that only revealed her head, hands, and shoes. She was a petite little thing, which I thought would be a relief. She looked way too normal. Sayabon climbed into the back seat and said, Thank you. I didn't think drivers were ever in this area. She flashed a sweet smile and buckled her seatbelt. She looks like a human, but humans are definitely not allowed to use Cerber, so what is she? This wouldn't typically bother me if she had a third eye or a protruding underbite of razor-sharp teeth, but she just looked like the average commuter and that was unsettling in this very specific circumstance. I can't say that they are. I just happen to be in the area, I said, staring at her through my rearview window. Angela seemed to be fairly unfettered by the new passenger. She had nothing to contribute. I pulled back onto the freeway, glancing every few seconds to see a smiling Sayabon looking back at me. She's likely under the impression that I'm thinking of a decent pickup line. In actuality, I was trying to read the room a bit to see if it was appropriate to ask possibly the dumbest question I've ever verbally vomited. So, uh, what are you? I ask. What's that supposed to mean? She asked so defensively. I mean, what, what kind of thing are you? You look way too normal to be using Cerber, so what are you? It would take an expert team of surgeons from France to remove the foot I just shoved down my own throat. If you can believe it, I was entirely shameless in my questioning. My sister was clearly appalled since she turned her head towards me, mouth agape in utter horror. If she didn't look so dead, it would have been funny. However, she looked very dead and that caused my body to visibly shudder. What are you talking about? I'm clearly a beautiful woman! Sayabon all but screamed it at me. Yeah, James, shut all the way up! my sister hissed through her freaky post-mortem teeth. What? I asked, thinking my question was perfectly valid. I should have guessed that Angela knew something that I didn't by her reaction. 
I should have stopped there, apologized, waited until Sayabon exited my car and asked Angela what the big deal was, but I didn't. Oops. Big oops. From the back seat, I could hear gurgling and panting. I looked in the mirror to see that Sayabon was shaking violently and her skin was bubbling. It looked like black billiard balls were crawling violently under her epidermis. Her eyes took on a bright yellow, a rectangular iris forming like that of a goat or a frog. Damn it, James! Now you've done it! Angela yells in a panic, wincing and huddling by the car door. It looked like she was trying to brace herself for a detonation. Well, I guess she technically was. Saibon's face started to stretch, her face forming a long, horse-like muzzle. Her arms wiggled into a transition of black tentacles, writhing and rapidly becoming larger. Her long red hair morphed into wet, obsidian strands. She looked like a horse octopus. Between glances off the road and my rearview mirror, her physical being became far more atrocious, and I couldn't help but autopilot my way down I-5 in the meantime. I could see her chest heaving and falling with every snort of hot breath. She went from being this tiny doll to being a massive mess of tendrils behind a set of glowing eyes. She quite literally filled most of my car. What, what the hell are you, lady? My voice cracked as if I was 16 again. That sort of sight will suck the masculinity right out of you and make you a mouse in no time flat. A sharp bray escaped her horse-like lips and caused me to lose hearing. I could see that Angela was trying to bark the answer at me. What? I ask, hearing my own heavily muffled reply. She's a Kelpie! Angela screams, throwing her hands up. What the hell is a... I couldn't finish my question before one of Sayabon's slimy tentacles plunged its way into my mouth. As if I hadn't humiliated myself enough with my tone-deaf night of interrogations, I subjected myself to real-life hentai on top of that. Super. I took one hand off the wheel to try and yank the tentacle out of my throat, swerving at 75 miles per hour in a frenzied panic. Another appendage wrapped around my chest, my throat, and my left leg. As if my stupidity wasn't done controlling the events of this evening enough, I decided to let go of the steering wheel entirely to get a better grip. Bigger oops. I was losing consciousness and strength quickly. I haven't been able to breathe for a good two minutes now, and with a surging adrenaline rush to try and stay alive, my legs involuntarily stiffened to find leverage. On the gas pedal. Of course. Biggest oops. I found myself speeding down an empty highway, wrestling with a pissed-off ponypus, trying desperately to stay alive, and crashed my tank of an SUV into a ditch. Though it was extremely dangerous and entirely unintentional, totaling my vehicle is what saved my life. I blacked out temporarily and woke up to an uncomfortable stillness that followed the car accident. I could hear Sayabon breathing quietly in the back seat, and it sounded like that's all she was doing. I slowly looked back, blood trickling into one eye, and see that she's still knocked out. After feeling relief wash over me, I was hit with an overwhelming amount of pain from the impact, as well as overexertion from my defending my airway. I crawled out of my car and dropped to the ground, directly onto my back, knocking the wind out of my already fragile chest. I gripped my shoulder and let out a man's groan. I lay as flat as possible, looking up and trying to mind too much movement of my neck and back. Angela pokes her face into my vision directly above my body, and I ask her to get my phone. Angela hands my phone to me, and I tap on the emergency number, bringing the phone up to my ear. Hi, Jim. It appears you've been in an accident. It's Adeline, with her annoying, jovial voice. I'm sending two drivers to your location, both equipped with Cerber-employed physicians. I assume your sister will be joining you? That wench... I'm agitated and grateful all at once. Yeah, I choke out to her. Have him pick up three tacos and a burrito with extra nacho cheese and a bottle of acetaminophen. You're buying. I drop my arm to the side and allow myself to pass out. I wake up four hours later, suffering a very minor concussion, a shattered esophagus, and some bruising on my bones. We were put up at a mediocre hotel room stocked with an obscene amount of Mexican food and a tall bottle of heavy painkillers. 
I sit up, knock the painkillers off my nightstand, and grab a burrito. Alcoholics shouldn't touch opioids. I already knew that. I'll pat myself on the back for the one responsible decision I made by stuffing my face with my favorite addiction. I quietly ate my burrito in bed and glanced over at Angela. She was sitting in a dusty rose slipper chair, arms folded and staring at the ceiling with her legs crossed. I looked back down at my burrito and allowed myself to bathe in shame for my irresponsible lack of couth. The disheartening fact that I almost died in two different ways in a matter of five minutes was startling and blanketed me like a guilt quilt. I messed up so bad tonight, and I'm due for a round of penance. I'm sorry, I say, my mouth full of burrito innards. I wasn't thinking properly and put us into a dangerous situation. She raises her hand at me, gesturing for me to quit while I'm ahead. I listen this time, mostly because my mouth is full. I'm already dead, doofus, she calmly reminded me as she continued to stare at the ceiling. I wasn't in any danger at all. There's seriously no need to apologize. All right, I say, emotionally wounded. Where's my car? You totaled it, James. We're going to be stuck here for a few days until Cerber can iron out the details with your insurance. Adeline called me and filled me in on the process and said she's going to take care of it. There's nothing that can be done for at least two days, so focus on healing. We waited ten years, we can wait two more days. Her disposition softened, trying to soothe me. Okay. I continue eating my burrito, reflecting on the antics of the evening. Angela? What? She asked as if she was prepared for another blow of foolhardy questions. What the heck is a Kelpie? I was a complete jerk to Sayabon and apologized to her. I added $1,000 of my own cash to her server account. Sadly, that only gets her about four blocks. She was gracious about it, though. Sayabon apologized for power fisting my throat. I told her she had no reason to be sorry, and we ended our call on a good note. She gave me four bat wings and a review that read, He's cute for a Neanderthal, I'll ride him again. Which was beyond kind of her, but now I'm not sure if she was pissed or flirting. Both, maybe? I'll continue to do my best at keeping my mouth closed. My social ineptitude is staggering, but I'm learning a very valuable lesson in humility. Not much transpired in the first day. I didn't have insurance through Cerber, and the agents that handle my claims specifically are human. Adeline's having a wicked hard time finding an in with the company that I'm insured with. She says that if it takes more than a week, they'll just replace my car altogether and terminate the claims. But why don't they just do that anyway? <sighs> Who knows? Maybe it's her way of ensuring that I stay in one place and heal as best as I can. She could just be putting it off to practice a little damage control. Something tells me it's the latter. Cerber puts us up with some pretty awesome accommodations. Angela's been balls deep in books for days now, trying to figure out what that silver bullet could possibly mean. She thinks that if we find its meaning, then we can find the origin of Wade's beliefs. We find the origin, we can combat them properly. Not sure how useful I can be in this situation, but even if I just get a front row seat to watch her haul off on Wade, I'll be satisfied. Accommodations also include an unhealthy enablement of my Mexican food obsession, as well as a personal nurse and doctor. They're both black-eyed people, which I'm not entirely sure what that is, but they're nice enough. Probably the tamest entities I've ever been around. Fun fact, paranormal medicine is a thing and it is incredible. My esophagus, concussion, and superficial injuries have completely healed. Get this, they were able to inject a rapid healing medication that was taken from a strain of werewolf flu. I look and feel like I may stand a chance at talking crap to a Kelpie again. Just kidding. Sort of. I spent a lot of my time talking to Borg on the phone. I guess he caught wind of the accident and was disheartened by it. Ironically, he sent over an iron nail. It was delivered to me in a tiny green box with a note that read, Borg sorry Jim got mouth violated. Borg send iron nail. Good for fence, good for Kelpie. But what started as a gratitude phone call turned into construction shop talk on a few occasions. 
Borg like Jim. Jim like Borg. On the second day in, I woke up at 2 a.m. to Angela's face about an inch away from mine. I flew up onto my bed like a weird sheet surfer, screaming nothing intelligible with hands above my head, spider monkey style. I pulled down on the bed, gripping my chest, and said, What, Angela? You talk a lot of crap for somebody who startles so easily, she says, slightly amused. I found plenty on the silver bullet, but not anything that makes sense. She walks over to one of many books she has littering the floor of our room. All right. I swing my legs over the side of the bed, placing my hands in my lap. So what have you found, then? Can we use it against Wade in any way? Not that I can tell, no, she says, looking down at her book. I'm only finding ways to defeat evil entities with silver bullets. Nothing that says they're used to aid them. This is assuming, of course, that Wade is evil. Excuse me, if? I ask, completely bewildered. Yes, if. Just because he killed me does not mean he is evil. She said that so confidently. Okay, I'm lost. What part of murder is not evil? I ask, my head spinning. Murder to you, sacrifice to the other, martyrdom to another. Death isn't always meant to be sinister. Just because I didn't want to die doesn't make his objective evil. We may have been going about this the wrong way the whole time. Angela sat on the floor with her legs crossed, putting her head into her cupped hands. So you're thinking this is some sort of protection doodad? I ask. I guess. She folds her arms tightly against her chest. I'm still not entirely sure. We may have to just fly into this blind. I would suggest contacting a priest, but given your line of work, it could tarnish anything you have left of your credibility among the paranormal. I throw both fists up, give her the double bird special. Okay, on that note, I'm going back to sleep. As soon as my head hits the pillow, the hotel line rings. I throw a bit of a flailing tantrum before picking up the phone. On the other end, I can only hear a faint rustling of what sounded like wind. Uh, hello? I ask, looking at my sister with one eyebrow raised. Ah, uh, James. It's a man who sounds like a cat that ate the canary. That's what I noticed Angela is violently shaking, cowering against the corner of the room, eyes welling up. Who is this? I asked the man with a bit of concern to my disposition. I hear that you're looking for me. He says it in a smooth, as cream voice. I'm Wade. You son of a bitch! You bet your sorry ass I'm looking for you! I scream it into the receiver. Pure rage surged its way through every nerve in my body like I was electrocuted with blind madness. Calm yourself, child. Now he definitely sounds condescending. You'll get your chance. I'm in need of a ride. You happen to have time for a request? Oh, are, are little bitches considered paranormal now? That's news to me. I thought cowards like you had a super cool fan club that congregates in the basements for pre-murder circle jerks. Does that come before or after having sex with your mom? Sorry, folks. I tried. But let's face it, he had that coming, and I'm sure a lot of you would be disappointed in me for not properly tearing this wart to shreds. He laughed in an unsettling manner. <laughs> ah, child. You know, not the dire situation you've stumbled in. I clenched my teeth, blood boiling so hot that I could feel myself sweat as he continued. That's fine. In due time, I suppose. In the meantime, please respond to my request. I'll be waiting. The line goes dead. I waste no time and call Adeline immediately. She picks up the phone and starts with, James, panic shrouding her voice. I don't want to hear it, Adeline. I get dressed, putting the iron nail in my pocket. Get me a car. Now. I don't give a crap what it is. Get a car out front. James, I'm not above begging. Please don't. Car now! I scream at her and hang up. Angela, we're going for... I stop and come to the startling realization that Angela isn't in my room anymore. I frantically race to my phone, ignoring the Cerber notifications and try calling her. My calls went straight to voicemail. I could feel my torso caving in, anxiety rushing over my body. He must have her. I don't know how, but my intuition is telling me that he somehow has Angela. I run down to the front desk of the hotel, finding a silver plate holding a set of keys 
and a note from Adeline that reads, please, in the name of all things holy, don't do this. I swipe the keys and rush out to find a standard black luxury sedan waiting for me. I all but fly into the front seat, turn the ignition, and mount my phone on the dash. I tap the Cerber app and buckle up as it loads. My sister is gone. I am armed with absolutely no useful information, nor any weapons. I can't just let this opportunity slip, especially with my sister being held hostage. I'm rushing into a situation with my presence and good intentions only. This is how he wanted it, though. I had no time to waste. Cerber booted up to the request homepage with one notification already three minutes old. I tap on accept. Got you, you son of a... I just accepted a request from the Archangel Michael. Up next, it's the conclusion of I Drive for Cerber by Mofucius on Weird Darkness. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests, events, and merchandise. You can download word search puzzles based on episodes of the podcast. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You can also hear auditions I've submitted for other voiceover projects and get updates on the progress of those I've been cast in, such as my voice acting roles as Wolverine and J. Jonah Jameson in a couple of Marvel fan series, or as Green Lantern Hal Jordan in a DC fan project. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. The location to picking up Michael was a shanty little bar that looked like it allowed indoor smoking and turned a blind eye to quaaludes. Michael was dressed in cowboy boots with an adorable matching hat, a pastel orange western-style shirt, and very neat blue jeans. He resembled either a cop or someone who was trying to be a cowboy for the first time. Kind of like those Scandinavian folks who are obsessed with westerns and intentionally go to the Alamo without a field trip slip. Westerns are boring. I'm not sorry for saying that. He almost anxiously got into the front passenger seat of my car. His apprehensive nature completely negates what I heard on the phone. Great. More weird stuff that doesn't make sense. You know, maybe I'm just too simple. Who knows? He gets into my car and I look at him like I'm expecting the first swing. Up close, he looks exhausted and in the middle of an existential crisis. I did not want to relate to this weirdo. Are you the jerk? I ask, completely ready to die. It's inevitable in this line of work. Are you the intellectual? Oh, right. You're the dumbass that's about as well mannered as a toddler riled up on Red Bull. Oh, my God, he is me. I think I'm in love. Who are you? I ask, completely befuddled. I wanted to kill this guy just two minutes ago, very slowly. Now I kind of want to take this guy inside for a beer. Now you can't read, either. How they even let you have a license? In fact, how are you even still alive? He gave me this crazy wide-eyed expression, leaning his face entirely too close to mine. Oh, and yes, he did sound like a genuine cowboy. Are you just going to keep asking me unhelpful questions, or are we going to play ball and tell me what in tarnation's going on? Yeah, I mocked him. We're in love now. It's okay. All right. I'm not Wade. I'm Michael, the Archangel. I'm not going to waste any more of your time. We have crap to do, son." He said this, pointing to my mounted phone. On the screen was a destination in a residential area. A nice neighborhood. 
That doesn't settle me in any way, though. Rich people are creeps worse than my passengers. Self-made monsters. Terrific. While we make our way there, you mind telling me why you decided to intercept my very well-earned date with death and dismay? I ask, less pushy. Despite enjoying this back-and-forth banter, I figured it was a bad idea to piss off an angel responsible for assembling victorious ethereal armies. I may be sassy, but I promise I'm not as stupid as I look. I don't care about dying, but no one's actually trying to earn a fast track to hell. Divination, son. What's it look like? He asks, putting a poorly handmade cigarette in his mouth. You're about to go marching to your death, and you have the balls to think you've got the balls for it? Um, what? I ignored the fact that he lit up a cigarette. In my car. That's typically a no-no, since this is technically a company car, and I'm still pissed at Adeline. I was just traveling down an even deeper rabbit hole of confusion. All right, I need to re-examine the facts. You're an angel, right? As in one of the angels? Yeah. He took a long, heroic drag of his cigarette and continued, and I'm here to save your sorry butt. You're about to tangle with a lone skinwalker. He raises his eyebrows at me. The Native American myth? I guess I really shouldn't call that a myth at this juncture. That's right. What's dangerous about a lone skinwalker is they've been cast out of their tribe. He's only 150 years old, very young. Yeah, he's basically a fetus, I say, rolling my eyes. Now, you would be a fetus in this situation. There are skinwalkers that are nearly as old as me. I immediately wanted to ask how old he was, but I thought better of it. The reason he's so dangerous is he's lawless not bound to any tribal rules, though skinwalkers have little of those to begin with. I impatiently tapped my thumb on the steering wheel, now slightly excited to land at our next stop. I think I know what's coming. Since you are too bullheaded to back down and too stupid to handle this alone, I decided to help you out. He grins, showing a couple gold-capped teeth and radiating confidence. In turn, I also felt confident, Thanks. Now, where are we? I ask, putting my car in park and killing the ignition. I have a guy who keeps everything you need right here in this home. Can't exactly run a storefront with this type of material on account of licensing being a necessity in this state. Some folks just need to handle an advanced problem just one time. He unbuckles his seatbelt and climbs out of the car. Michael doesn't even bother knocking and enters the home. Every room was unburdened by furniture, as well as a lack of lighting. We head down to the basement, which was lit with a light violet, bathing the room in an emotional shade of calm. Littered about the room, which I can only describe as an organized mess of different types of weapons, stood a drag queen. Yep, very clearly a drag queen. The only reason I could even guess this was the cartoon-inspired makeup and a wig that looked like it could be a living creature piled high on his head. From the neck down, he was dressed in a skin-tight tracksuit, exposing his well-kept physique. I-, I know, keep your mouth shut, Jim. Azazel, Michael says, pointing behind himself at me. I brought the kid with the mouth on him. In the most flamboyant voice imaginable, Azazel says, Hi, honey, you're dancing with a skinwalker. Azazel does a mild salsa dance behind his workbench. So I'm told. I'm trying to remain professional because not only am I standing in the presence of an archangel, the drag queen standing before me is a demon. I know what Azazel is. Okay, I'm going to give you a 9mm handgun, two 11-round magazines of pure silver, a Molotov cocktail, and a lighter. Now, you can't kill a skinwalker with silver, it'll only slow it down. Do your best to aim for his legs and arms. When a skinwalker dumps its human form, It'll have freakishly quick abilities in both arms and legs, so don't skip any limbs. By the time Azazel was finished giving me these directions, he'd piled everything into a backpack. I'm sorry, I have to ask. Both Michael and Azazel are now looking at me as though I'm a burden on them. Angels and demons working together? Fallen, asshole, I'm a fallen angel. Azazel crosses his arms, glaring at me. Right. You guys actually work together, though? I ask. Yes. 
Michael replies, Fallen angels were still angels once. Not all demons have bad intentions. Some like humans quite a lot and want to maintain a sort of balance. All right. I grab the backpack, completely done with religious topics. You mind fixing the interception, Michael? I would really like to finish this. Sure, kid. He waves at Azazel and we begin our ascent from the basement. One more thing, Jim, says Azazel, waving. Don't miss. You can't afford to miss. I nod with a smile and say, thanks, Azazel. He smiles and turns around to finish his original project. As we're walking back to the car, I rehearse my plan in my mind. I've never actually shot a firearm before, so this was going to be interesting. I've also never had to huck a Molotov before. I may actually die trying to kill this thing. Michael and I get back into the car and I ask him, All right, I have to know, why is Azazel a drag queen? Michael let out a single chuckle and said, Well, Azazel was cast out of heaven for teaching humans how to build weapons and put war makeup on. He's always enjoyed cosmetics, so he decided to make it a hobby. Sounds reasonable, I said, with a genuine nod. So what does Wade want? Obviously, Michael has powers. I'm not going to be shy about asking. Not that I ever had that problem to begin with. Michael pulls out another shanty stogie, lights it up, and gets comfortable. Remember what it was like losing Angela? How you felt lost and empty and your life had less flavor? Yes, I replied. Well, when some folks lose their sense of home and their people, they begin grieving in one of two common ways. Some become hollow, much like you. Some become angry and develop an insidious agenda. They hurt others to gain control of their own pain, Michael says, never breaking eye contact. So why Angela? I ask. Victim of circumstance, son. She's special, but not that special, he replied. Any idea as to why there was a silver bullet hanging from her body? What about the insanity parade he conducted on her corpse? I'm angry now. Not at Michael, I haven't had a taco in several hours. I put the bullet there. I was hoping somebody would have caught on to that clue. Of course, that was a bust. He takes another drag of his cigarette. The mutilation was pure rage. He's lost and upset. That's why he killed Angela before he had his fun with her. Watch it, Michael, I said swiftly. My sister is not a sideshow attraction. Easy, son, he said calmly. I was actually hoping to piss him off. Point being is he didn't have a reason. The whole point of all of this is he's just doing vile things out of rage. I was entirely unsatisfied with that answer. It's one thing to murder someone with intent, but to entirely disregard all life over a temper tantrum, that's a whole other level of evil. Do you know where Angela is? I asked. She's home, kid, he said, pointing upward. Her time here was served. She brought you to where you needed to be, so it was time for her to return. The oxygen in every fiber of my being was sucked right out of my body. Oh, sorry, kid. He puts one hand on my shoulder and squeezed, but we all go home at some point. That's just how it is. Yeah, I croaked. What was the point of ever going after this thing now? The only reason I got involved was to help Angela cross over, and she's done that now. Listen, I know you're probably thinking of quitting, but you honestly want this to happen to another young lady? A child? He asked me gently. You put way too much faith in my integrity. I shook my head, scoffing. But no, I don't want this to happen to anybody else. I'm going to finish this. Good, Michael said, patting me again on the shoulder. We spent the rest of the ride in silence while Michael chain-smoked. I continued to rehearse my plan, and I was losing confidence with every repetition. Maim and set it on fire. Maim and set it on fire. Maim and set it on fire. I pull up in front of the bar I had originally picked Michael up from. Since Michael was not a danger to me in the slightest, his ride ended up being free. That's fine. I was in no position to pout about finances after the free gear to roast my sister's killer. Michael gets out of the car and rounds his way to my window. You gotta lay off the Mexican food, son. It'll kill you. He half smiled and then walked away. Thanks, Michael, I replied, watching him walk into the bar. 
I decided this job was far too much for me. I couldn't possibly do this. Well, not alone. I exit the Cerber app and decide to make a phone call. Jim? Borg barks into the phone. Borg, I replied, attempting to match his gusto. Hi, Jim. Feeling better? I can hear his tusks scraping the phone as he spoke. Yeah, thanks, Borg. I put the backpack of Arsenal in my back seat. You feel like taking down a skinwalker with me tonight? Borg hates skinwalker. Borg, help. Jim have right protection? Jim stupid. Borg have to ask. That gelatinous, jovial jerk. Yes, Borg, I say, trying to remember his honesty isn't personal. I have silver bullets and a Molotov. Okay, Jim. Only fire kill Skinwalker. Borg wrestle for Jim. I could hear whatever poor recliner he was ascending from cry out as he stood. Thanks, Borg. Oh, and one more thing, I add. Yes, Jim, Borg replies. Take a dump before you get into the car, please. After I finished my call to Borg, I spent the drive seeping into my own thoughts. My heart found a new way to break as I sat in silence knowing I likely won't be seeing Angela again. I never questioned if she was dead or not, but I had become so subconsciously numb that I completely forgot what it was like to hurt. I was actually grateful for the pain now. With every tick that increased the number on the odometer, so did my wrath. I didn't even have the urge to stop and get taquitos. I spent 10 years waiting for some sort of closure, and even though I was robbed of an opportunity to say goodbye for a second time, I couldn't help but feel a sense of completion. I know who killed Angela, and I was on my way to give him a Borg beatdown. There's no better closure. I would not be able to say goodbye to Angela, but I take great comfort knowing that I will be able to say hello again instead. For now, I will allow myself to hurt. It helps chip away at any fears that I may have left. I pull up to Borg's dilapidated ruins Borg is outside carrying what looks like a large sword as he swaddled his way up to the car. Crap, is he even going to fit into the car? Borg, what in the hell do you have in your hand? I ask as he packs himself into the front passenger seat. Borg bring Falchion sword, good for murder sport, Borg says with an infectious amount of excitement. You don't think it's overkill? I have a gun, you know, I reply. Jim have pitiful boomstick. Borg have real weapon. Jim just jealous, Borg says, hauling the ridiculous blade over his shoulder and into the back seat. I dropped the topic. Borg? I swallowed loudly as I continue. You wouldn't eat me, would you? Borg like Jim. Borg no eat Jim. Eating Jim would be like Jim eat dog, Borg says matter-of-factly. <laughs> you sassy bastard, I laughed. All right, well, I'm glad that you can find me too adorable to eat, I fire back. Letting out his booming laughter, he replies, Jim no cute, Jim just helpless. He laughs harder, clutching his gelatinous gut. All right, I chortle. Are you ready to help me end this? Yeah, Jim. Borg and Jim go party now. Borg smiles. Man, is that how orcs party? Ogres? I shudder to think of what a Borg bachelor party would look like. We spent most of the ride talking about our plan and construction hacks, all while Borg sharpens his sword. I don't think scraping this thing on a rock actually improved anything. However, I grinned at the idea of Wade suffering at the will of a dull blade. In five miles, take exit for Fink Road, the GPS chimes. Borg semi-silently lifts his head, looks at the phone, and then looks at me. Now we get serious, Jim! He was trying his best to keep his voice down, but still failed. I know, Borg, I said, throttling the gas. In half a mile, take exit for Fink Road, the GPS continues. I came off the freeway and start my way down Fink Road. The road's barely paved and unlit. I flip my high beams on and continue speeding my way through the thick darkness. Looking behind me, I can only see a faint glow of my brake lights reflecting off of the clouds of dust kicking up behind me. In 25 miles, your destination will be on the right. Borg must have sensed tension and says, Jim, we need to talk about plan. Uh-huh, I say, keeping my eyes on the road. When Borg sees Skinwalker, Borg attack. Borg stab Skinwalker and pin him to ground. 
Jim shoots Skinwalker knees, elbows, and eyes if Jim can aim, Borg says, as gently as an orc can. Yep, got it. And then what? I ask, still keeping my gaze focused. Jim light Molotov and smash on Skinwalker head. Skinwalker will ignite. Very flammable, Borg replies. Flammable? I ask, puzzled. Yes, Skinwalker afraid of fire because Skinwalker catch fire easy. Borg like to watch. Borg lets out a creepy, thick giggle. That is sick, Borg. I nervously laugh along with him. In seven and a half miles, your destination will be on the right. I feel my knuckles whiten, death gripping the steering wheel. I accelerate to 70 miles an hour. I am so ready for this and truly looking forward to my next burrito, if I can manage to make it out alive, that is. We pull up to a vacant mortuary. No one appeared to be standing outside. No lights were on, and the atmosphere was entirely silent, as if we were standing at zero gravity. Borg reaches into his shirt pocket and pulls out a pair of glasses, taking great care not to scratch the lenses. Great, I say. I'm armed with weapons I've never used, and my backup is a handicapped ogre. Borg not ogre! Borg orc! Jim have handicapped mouth! He barked at me. All right, I'm sorry. I'm just nervous, I guess, I reply. Is okay, Jim. Please focus, Borg replies with sincerity and confidence. I keep my headlights on and stare at the front door of the mortuary, waiting for this thing to emerge. I almost missed Wade walking out from behind the left-hand side of the building. He was dressed in a pinstripe suit, slicked jet black hair, bronzed complexion, and a fairly young face. Michael said he was around 150 years old, but he looked like he was in his early 20s. He stood grinning at me, blocking my gaze. Borg and I looked at each other, nod, and get out of the car. I swing the backpack over my shoulder and Borg does the same with his falchion sword. We begin towards Wade at a cautious pace as he glides towards us, entirely unfettered by our preparedness. We all stop walking once we're about ten feet away from each other and I say, Wade? My voice was about as smooth as gravel. Wade opens his arms as if to embrace, Jim! Both Borg and I put one leg back, bending our knees to receive an attack. Wade puts his hands up and lowers his head slightly. All right, you don't trust me. That's probably wise on your part. I learned a little bit about you. I start in my infamous false confidence. They are a skinwalker, and not even your own tribe wants anything to do with you. To get caught strangling the family pets? I finish, satisfied with that low blow, which I could see ticked him off. Nah, not for strangling family pets. He started pacing, circling. I didn't see Borg flinch, so I tried to relax as much as possible. I trust that Borg will lead when it's time to move. I can see that you're not entirely certain what a skinwalker is, or you wouldn't be asking me such a foolish question. That's your mistake. Trust me, pal, I've made many mistakes before this one. Pretty sure a Kelpie popped that cherry for me, I reply with cool ease. <laughs> right! He rolls his eyes. Well, a skinwalker is essentially a Navajo medicine man that succumbed to dark magic. He looks up at us as if expecting some weird withdrawal or newfound fear. I met quite a few beings who could decimate this freak. When Wade doesn't receive his desired reaction, he continues, keeping his hands behind his back and standing up straight. Medicine men have never been known to live far beyond the normal expiration of a human. However, Medicine men who insist on using dark magic to assert themselves in war, that is greatly frowned upon. My tribe couldn't handle my ideologies, so I was cast out and, you know what, it's been the most liberating experience I could have been gifted with. I roam as I please, I live as I please, and I kill as I please. Gross, I reply, my blood boiling. Borg remains stoic and silent, fixated on our target. He looks so damn cool right now. Wade gets impatient. Child, you'll either worship me or fear me. The only other option is death. He sneers, his voice starting to gurgle. I'm guessing this is his rendition of wolfing out. I didn't come here with silver bullets and an orc to join your crap show religion, Wade. I yelled at him. Years of frustration, pain, and despair have led me to being absolutely fearless and angry. I came here to annihilate you for your crimes against humanity particularly against my sister. I've literally ghost-toted legendary entities that would serve you up on a slice of toast before a morning run. 
you're just a well-preserved human with magic tricks, I reply with searing vitriol. This does him in. I finally touch the nerve. You will respect me! He screams it in his watery voice. Sounds like something's bubbling up from his throat. His skin begins to turn bright red. I don't mean his cheeks. Every exposed portion of his skin is turning red. I can see Borg bracing for something. In turn, I do the same. Looks like the tea is on. Come at me, jerkwad. If those would have been my last words, that would have been epic. The skin and clothing begins to melt from Wade's exterior, revealing a dark shade of espresso. I could hear his bones crack and his limbs disjoint until he dropped onto all fours with his head down. His roar could only be described as a pumas with the bass cranked all the way up. Once Wade was finished transforming, he slowly lifted his head, and that is when I finally felt dread in his presence. Half of his face was occupied with a lipless mouth adorning large, pointed teeth. He had small black eyes fitted just above his shapeless nose and long black hair that went down to his waist. I watched his chest heave and fall with every breath as he stared straight at me. Borg snaps into action and darts after Wade, raising his sword, accidentally smacking me in the face with it. I hit the ground and yelp out like a wounded coyote, holding my face in efforts to quell the ringing in my ears. Borg turns around, still holding his sword up high. Jim! In a flash, Wade tackles Borg right into the car with enough force to cave the driver's side door in. Broken glass rained on top of them as they struggled. Wade sank his massive teeth into Borg's shoulder, causing Borg to scream and release his grip to favor his new wound. As I squint in their direction, I notice Borg trying to get on his feet while Wade starts speed crawling towards me. I panic and start scurrying backwards, trying not to look away from this horrifying psycho spiders sprinting in my direction. In my sad attempt to back away, I realized I am nowhere near my weapons. Oops. I hear Borg stumbling his way towards us, falling to his knees every so often, undoubtedly from the pain. I just had to stall this thing for a few seconds to allow Borg to catch up. Wade jumps on top of me, sitting on my stomach and squeezing my throat with both hands. He laughs in a very moist, deep, and devious manner while I try clawing at his arms for release. It simply wasn't working. I could hear Borg getting closer, breathing heavy and clearly struggling. I have to do something. That's when I remembered grabbing that iron nail that Borg had gifted me. I quickly shoved my hand into my pocket, feeling the cold, rough surface of the nail. I yank it out of my pocket and I slam it into Wade's neck causing him to release his grip and reach for the nail. In that split second, I wiggle from underneath him. Borg grabs Wade by the hair and slams him onto the ground. Borg treated Wade like a rag doll and kept swinging him around until Wade could no longer move, entirely immobilized and worn out. Borg slammed Wade into the dirt again, shoving his sword through his chest and burrowing the other end into the ground beneath him, pinning him in place. Jim, get Molotov! Borg says with exhaustion. I fumble my way to the backpack, pulling out the anarchist's grenade and run over to Wade's body. What's really creepy is he was still breathing even with that blade buried deep into his chest. He didn't bleed either. He was like some sort of sentient corn husk doll. I stand over Wade's body and light the Molotov, watching him look up at the sky. He had nothing to say and no fight left to offer. I very nearly felt sorry for him, I raise the Molotov above my head and slam it right into his stomach, his whole body engulfed in a matter of seconds in soft chartreuse flames. Borg and I both dropped and sat in silence, panting from expulsion of adrenaline and newly acquired pain. Are you all right? I ask Borg through breaths. Borg fine, he replies, shifting his weight. Thank you, Borg. I couldn't have done this without you. I try really hard not to tear up, but since Borg and I have already crossed the threshold of leaking bodily fluids a long time ago, I allow myself to sob. It's okay, Jim, Borg says, gingerly hugging me about as gently as a rusty bear trap. Wade gone now. Jim can heal inside. He finishes, patting me on the back. I limp over to the car to retrieve my phone and I realize I have 13 missed calls from Adeline. Here we go. I call her back and she picks up in the middle of the first ring. Jim, are you all right? Yeah, I'm okay. Thanks to Borg, of course, I reply. 
Adeline lets out a sigh of relief and says, Thank goodness. Is Borg okay? Yeah. We need a ride, though. What happened to the company car you had for a grand total of six hours? Suddenly she's furious. <laughs> so much for being worried about my safety. Well, the driver's side got crushed in the middle of our dispute, I reply, wincing at my own words. She lets out a snort and says, All right, I'm sending a car after you two. Thanks, Adeline, I reply. After this, you won't be hearing from me anymore. I don't think I can work for Cerber any longer. Think again, Jim, she says with a maniacal tone. You now owe me a car. I've already ironed out the kinks with your own car, but you're going to stay on with Cerber and regain enough funds to cover the damage of the one you borrowed. Once you repay me for this car, only then will we talk about releasing you from Cerber. You understand me? She huffs. I guess, I reply with defeat. Good. I'll allow you one week to recover, but then I expect you to be accepting rides immediately after. Oh, and watch your mouth. I'm getting complaints about your attitude from the clients, she finishes. Yeah, okay, sorry, Adeline, I say, rolling my eyes. Wonderful, she replies in her signature bubbly tone. Get well soon, Jimmy boy. Thank you for being a loyal employee at Cerber. The line clicks and dies. Damn it. I really need a burrito. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, including the show's Weirdos Facebook group, on the Contact Social page at WeirdDarkness.com. Also on the website, you can find free audiobooks that I've narrated, watch old horror movies with horror hosts at all times of the day for free, sign up for the newsletter to win free prizes, grab your Weird Darkness and Weirdo merchandise. Plus, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. The creepypasta I Drive for Cerber was written by Mofucius. You can find a link to the story in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 46, verses 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. And a final thought. Before you think that nobody loves you, remember that no matter who you are or what you've done or where you've been, someone, somewhere, sometime, has secretly cried for you, prayed for you, and sacrificed for you. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness. Hey Weirdos! I'm really excited to let you know that I am stepping into the Marvel Universe as the voice of J. Jonah Jameson in a new animated film coming in 2024 called Spider-Man Turning Point. That's right, I get to play Peter Parker's jerk of a boss. And not only am I a voice actor for this film, I'm also an executive producer because I believe in it. We even have a celebrity voice actor in the cast. Mike Vaughn was the voice of Ghostface in the Scream TV show. Well, he's voicing Harry Osborn. If you'd like to see some of the slick animation, the storyboards, character concepts, the first teaser trailer for the film, and more, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Spider-Man. We even have an original musical score. In fact, you're hearing Green Goblin's theme behind me right now. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Spider-Man. When you visit there, you'll also have an opportunity to get involved if you'd like, getting your name in the credits, getting a social media shout-out from the Spider-Man Turning Point production, get an animated thank you from Spider-Man himself just for you, and more. I cannot wait to bring my J. Jonah Jameson to you in 2024. 
Learn more about our upcoming animated film, Spider-Man Turning Point, at WeirdDarkness.com slash Spider-Man. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Spider-Man. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever noticed that in just about every post-apocalyptic TV show or movie, the electrical grid is gone? No power at all. Anywhere. No places to plug in a radio to get news. And you can forget about charging your mobile devices or relaxing in an air-conditioned house or apartment. We rely on electrical power. Did you know that the power grid we are currently surviving off of was designed in the 1800s? It's so fragile that in 2003, a tree branch hit a power line in Ohio, and it shut down 21 power plants, and close to 100 people died because of it. And it's not just natural disasters. In January, a power station in North Carolina was damaged by gunfire, marking the third time it happened. The terrifying truth is that our national security experts are warning us that our aging power grid is now more vulnerable than ever and these attacks just raise a new level of threat. Those post-apocalyptic TV and film scenarios could easily turn from fiction to fact. Imagine a blackout lasting not days, but weeks or even months. Your life would be frozen in time at the moment the power fails. Lights all over the country would go out, throwing people into total darkness. That's why having your own personal source of solar power is more important than ever. With the Patriot Power Generator, you get a solar generator that doesn't install into your house because it's portable. You can take it with you wherever you go, even use it indoors. And it's powerful enough for your phones, medical devices, even your refrigerator. Right now, you can go to 4Patriots.com – that's the number 4, Patriots.com – and use the code WEIRD to get 10% off your first purchase on anything on the website including the life-saving Patriot Power Generator. You'll also get their famous guarantee for an entire year after your order. Plus, free shipping on orders over $97. And the reason I approached 4Patriots to be a sponsor? A portion of every sale is donated to charities who support our veterans and their families. Prepare for the future. Go to 4Patriots.com today and use the code WEIRD to get 10% off. That's the number 4 Patriots.com promo code WEIRD and ensure you will survive the future. Hey Weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.